Along life's sandy shores, let me leave behind my humble footprints until the tide will come in to wash them away. For no matter how one is molded today, time and tide waits for no man. And the ravaging ways of history soon cast one unto its wilderness, a forgotten being in the midst of a bygone past. This is a story about a boy who grew up in the Seychelles archipelago in the Indian Ocean. At the age of 18, he went to study law in London, where he was subsequently called to the bar. He then returned to the Seychelles to become the first chief minister, first prime minister, and then founding president of the new republic. A year after being sworn in, his coalition partner and prime minister was instrumental in overthrowing him in a violent coup d'etat. For the next 15 years, he was forced to live in political exile in London and could only dream of his island home. In 1992, at the end of the Cold War, the Seychelles government opened the doors for multi-party democracy. He came back to a triumphant return, but unlike his violent opposition, he came back with a philosophy of reconciliation and peace. Now, 20 years later, in the year 2011, he has just won the Gussie Peace Prize, the Asian equivalent of the Nobel Peace Prize for outstanding contributions to world peace. This is a story of Sir James R. Mansion. Those were the days, my friends, I thought they never had. Just growing up in Seychelles, waking up in the morning, the crows of the roosters, to the murmur of the waves. In a home which was surrounded by a mango orchard. How can I forget those sweet days, which in Seychelles we used to call la belle époque, the good period. We were isolated a thousand miles from anywhere it was a peaceful life, and uh, let's say it's a way of life as God meant it to be until we started to, if you want, break away from our isolation and become part and parcel of this world of pressures and this world of conflict. It were good days. I remember them well, having to walk for example, from home every morning for two or three miles to the college where I was educated. Later on, when I became a bit older, I had a bicycle. And when I was on bicycle, many times I thought I was like a pilot in the air. As I rode along the road to the college at full speed, and one time falling down, making a fool of myself before a caravan of young ladies who were coming from the convent to go to church. There are many, if you want, snapshots which are embedded in my memory about these good old days. Let's say, for me, I had a happy childhood. Father, mother, and I was the eldest of six children. And we more or less got along very well. We were a united family, religious family. And every evening also, my mother, in order to put my other brothers to sleep, sang them a song, which I believe was the beginning to my long eternal repertoire of eternal songs of France, of England and other parts of the world. Jim is, uh, you know, he's one person I, I recall uh, very well because he was a bit of a character. And uh, Jim was always talking. He never, 
There was never any shortage of work of words from Jimmy. So we had we had school fights very often, especially during break time. And Jim was always ever ready to, to act as a mediator, stopping those, those fights. And there again, it showed uh, what a peace-loving uh, person he was. And that too has transpired throughout his political years. 1957 reminds me of our school play. An obvious play, when um, it's always a big occasion, you know, for students. With uh, Brother Austin leading, our headmaster, we stage Julius Caesar. It really um, gelled us together, I think, you know, as a team. And Jim was Mark Anthony. He loved that part. And until now, and occasionally also, you know, um, later, until quite also recently, he would go over his lines, friends, Romans, countrymen, lovers, lend me your ears. And I've not seen him also on the podium. You know, at political rallies, I always thought, here's Mark Anthony. That's not Jimmy Manka. That's what Mark Anthony is speaking. My father was self-made man. In, uh, his father was uh, Chinese and his mother of French extraction. And when he was very young, his father died and his uncle called for him to go to China. Those were the days when communism was taking over. The revolution was on in China. And my father luckily succeeded to run away. But by virtue of the experience which he had collected there, when he returned to Seychelles, he was a little bit like a one-eyed man in the kingdom of the blind. He knew what business was all about. He knew what survival was all about. So he started a business which grew and grew bigger during the Second World War when he took over license to supply ships that was coming to harbor. Very hard-working man, he knew success quite early and was able to bring my family, my mother, and all of us in a very comfortable way as we grew more and more prosperous in relation to what was wealth of the island at the time. I remember the day when I had to go to Seychelles, to leave Seychelles, to go and study in Yuki. First, let me say that those days, the only way out of Seychelles was by two ships of the British Indian Steam Corporation, which used to ply between Bombay and Mombasa and calling in Seychelles on the way to Mombasa, on the way from Mombasa. So I took uh, a steamship, I think it was a 14,000 tonner, the SS uh, Karanja. And uh, as we entered Mombasa, I could see suddenly, if you want uh, the railway lines, big hotels, things which I had not seen in Seychelles before. From Mombasa, I boarded a large cruise ship, the Brema Castle of the Union Castle Line, which had started from Durban and came across to Lorenzo Mark in Mozambique, Dar es Salaam, and then collected in Mombasa. And we did this fantastic trip up to Aden, through the Suez Canal, to Genoa, to Gibraltar, to Marseille, and then we passed through the Bay of Biscay until we arrived in Tilbury Docks. At the end of the 1950s, the UK had been through a decade and a half of rebuilding. New sovereignty had been instated. Churchill had been replaced by Anthony Eden. 
and due to poor health, Eden had been replaced with Harold Macmillan. It was a culture shock in the sense that the British were becoming less and less nationalistic, whereas we in Seychelles had been brought up in a spirit of respect for the royalty. I remember, for example, Levi Empire Day. My school, we used to go with other schools in the Gordon Square, where we would sing Flag of Britain, a lovely song. Flag of Britain, boldly braving over the eastern seas. Flag of Britain, boldly braving, blinding fog and adverse breeze. We salute thee and we pray, bless, O Lord, our land today. Now, this song had a special impact, and I learned it so well, and I thought I'd sing it well when I got to England. When I got to England, found out nobody knew about this song. And when I went to a cinema, and they played Gods of the Queen, many times I found that I was the only one standing up, whilst the rest of the audience had departed. These were changing times for England. Having come from a country that was so far from the UK, but yet so much more steeped in its colonial father's nationalistic pride, this attitude came as a shock to the young Jimmy Mancham. Although this was the case, he made the most of London, and although initially surprised at the British lack of nationalism, he approached his degree with gusto, ready to take on the world. Studying law at the Middle Temple was his reason for being there, but politics was never far from his agenda. After a chance meeting with the Deputy High Commissioner for Ghana, he decided to set up the Seychelles Student Union in London, later reflecting on this adventure as his base for entry into Seychelles politics before returning to the colony. It was around this time that Harold Macmillan had visited the Republic of South Africa, where he had delivered his Winds of Change speech, committing the British government to an overt policy of decolonization, of dismantling the empire, and getting rid as quickly as possible of their colonial responsibilities. My departure from Seychelles coincided with the moment when the British was declaring, started to declare colonial territories independent. The first territory to become independent, uh, this happened just after I got to England to study law, was Ghana, which became the Republic of Ghana. And um, of course, it's very obvious that the most conversations within the corridor of the Middle Temple those days were about politics and the future of other colonies in the world. The wind of change is blowing through this continent. And whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. And we must all accept it as a fact. And our national policies must take account of it. nation, Seychelles the destination, they all asked for some fun on the island. London had made a difference to Sir James. He had left Seychelles a few short years before a bright-eyed but naive student and was to come back a lawyer and a man of the world. Take a look in the air, he comes to Wilkie on the 22nd of February 1963, he married Heather Evans, with whom he has two children, Richard and Carolyn. He was practicing law on Mahe, but much to his father's disapproval, his political aspirations were what really drove him. My father was a man of wisdom, a man of great experience, and he thought that uh, politics was a game for opportunists or for failed lawyers. He wanted me to be a successful lawyer to do well, but against his own background of experiences in China, he realized the danger of a very active political life. He started a political newspaper, the Seychelles Weekly, as a vehicle for his thoughts on what was currently happening on the islands, and juggled the writing and editing of this with his work at the law courts. He started the newspaper with politics in mind. Uh, and 
as well as that, he loved writing. He loved the English language. And uh, it was like him. I mean, it did, did not surprise me. It did not surprise anybody to sort of see him start the newspaper. It did not. I mean, in fact, what would have surprised me is, is if he did not do anything, something like that. I would have been surprised by that. And, and at about the same time, too, SPUP, that's the other main political party, came into being. And uh, they also got the idea that they would uh, start a political paper. Uh, I think theirs was uh, the people, I think. And uh, for some time, the two papers were sort of rivaled each other. England was now heavily dispensing of its colonies, and the reality of Harold Macmillan's Winds of Change speech was gaining momentum. When I returned to Seychelles, and I saw that there was a group of people who wanted to declare independence in the Jan Smith fashion, that is, before the introduction of one man, one vote, that is, independence under the control of a small minority, against a background of my illegal studies and my, if you want, uh, idealism at that time, I thought it was my duty to oppose that movement. And from that on, day onwards, I became a political animal. Well, he had his, 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 his uh, good reasons for, 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 for not wanting Seychelles to become independent because we, we were not prepared for it. We were a very small country with a very fragile economy and uh, we opted for a system of integration with Britain. And that was well accepted by the majority of the people. The question of independence on the islands was there throughout the 60s and was the basis for the forming of the two main political parties. Sir James formed the DP party favouring a Western ideal with a free market economy. His dream was to transfer the Seychelles into the Switzerland of the Indian Ocean. At the same time, Albert René, who was to be Sir James's long-term political adversary, started his own political party, favouring links to the Soviet bloc. Sir James subsequently won all three general elections the two of them would contest. He started with the Victoria District Council. He won that. And uh, I think he was chairman of the Victoria District Council, not for a very long time, though. Uh, or perhaps uh, his interest in higher politics sort of overshadowed this. But I know that uh, he was busy with, in three, uh, three departments. One was the court, the other one was the newspaper, and then uh, with uh, the politics of Victoria and the politics of Seychelles. Before I became first prime minister, I also had become first chief minister. Now, chief minister is the highest position which a local national had in a colonial territory. L'action des éléments discipline. At that time, we had the British governor who represented the Majesty of the Queen, who was ultimately our head of state, and the British if you want, kept under the control a lot of areas of power, like foreign affairs, finance, etc. Sir James, with his joie de vivre, had a simple philosophy that simply put, spelled a happy Seychelles. His party wanted to put a man with a guitar under every coconut tree. He wanted to open the Seychelles to the world. He invited celebrities and foreign dignitaries alike to show off the islands, he opened the first airport in Seychelles, which effectively quadrupled the tourist industry overnight. By the early 70s, he was promoting Seychelles globally and aligning the islands with new friends. Jimmy was extremely popular with the whole spectrum of society in Seychelles. Um, in the crowd, he just lit up. I don't know what it is. I mean, um, he was a bicycle man. He was not really a man driving around in a Rolls Royce. He liked a big pair of black spectacles and a bicycle. That, to me, I was, that's the Jimmy as I remember him. 
and we'll always remember him really. There's incredible spectacles that kept coming on and off, on and off, on and off, 400 times a minute, and this big laugh, and then the breaking into song. Good man. In fact, he said it himself, I'm a, I'm a prince amongst princes and a commoner amongst commoners. And that was more or less the way he made his campaign throughout Seychelles, and that was why he became very, very popular. Albert Rennie and the SPUP were getting frustrated. They opposed everything that the Mansion's DP party did. If Sir James was overseas, they would spread the word that he was only interested in foreign affairs and not those of his people. If he dated a pretty woman, he was a playboy who was more interested in women than the job. When Sir James wanted to build the airport, René argued that it would have a quasi-military function and during any war would be a target for bombing. When the Americans came to build a tracking station to monitor the Indian Ocean, which was to bring much needed finance to the islands, the SPUP opposed it. René's SPUP was soon starting to gain recognition overseas. The Organization of African Unity, or the OAU as they were known, were committed to the total decolonization of Africa. It was clear that the question of independence was being argued over in the Seychelles, and they decided to help René's cause. René's SPUP started to receive money from Tanzania as a liberation movement. For the next few years, the two parties were at loggerheads over independence. People of Seychelles, do you want independence? No! People of Seychelles, do you want independence? The election results showed that the feeling amongst the people was that the country wasn't ready for independence from the United Kingdom. René catalyzed on anything that could bring the question of independence to the fore. It was only a matter of time before the islands would witness violence for the first time. Three bombs exploded, one in Sir James's office, one in the house of a DP supporter, and the other in the Reef Hotel, where two rooms were destroyed. As one local paper put it, the war was on. Meanwhile, Sir James's SDP kept triumphing in all elections held on the one-man, one-vote system. The SDP had won the elections on the party's anti-independence stance. It was still felt the British were behind Sir James, but when the issue of independence of the Seychelles was raised at the Fourth Committee of the United Nations, the British didn't oppose it. The message was beginning to filter through. The next few years saw the arrival to the islands of great names in show business, like Peter Sellers, George Harrison, Noel Coward and Roman Polanski. The islands were becoming popular, so James was starting to see the fruits from many seeds planted. He was still battling hard against Seychelles becoming independent. He didn't want the country to be forced into something that the majority of people didn't want, but increasing pressure was coming from the OAU and the British weren't resisting. In 1973, the British government announced that the popular and well-known governor, Sir Bruce Greatbatch, was to be replaced by the relatively unknown New Zealander, Mr. Colin Allen. Sir James started to realise that this was perhaps a message from the Foreign Office. Greatbatch, who has served admirably as a diplomat in Nigeria and Kenya, was about to be replaced by a man whose career had not gotten beyond the Pacific Islands of New Hebrides, and who was almost an unknown figure in Westminster and Whitehall. When Colin Allen disembarked in the Seychelles, fully plumed in his military attire as the governor and commander-in-chief of the archipelago, Sir James decided to organise a welcoming event and to utilise the occasion to openly call on the British government for a response to the wishes of the majority of the people of the Seychelles for their country to achieve closer links with the UK. On that day, Governor Colin Allen, in his return speech, made it a point to totally bypass the constitutional issue, which was bothering the people of the Seychelles. However, two days later, he invited Sir James to meet him at Government House on a one-to-one -one basis. The Governor told him that he had had a meeting at the Foreign Office in London and had a special message to convey. He said that whilst the Foreign Office was not going to issue an open invitation to Sir James for talks on the constitutional issue, the Foreign Office hoped that Sir James would find an excuse to be in London as soon as possible. When Sir James got to London, he booked into the Churchill Hotel in Portland Square. 
Soon after, he received a telephone call from a Mr. Dennis Greenham, who informed him that he was a special advisor to Foreign Minister James Callaghan. He was in fact a political appointee and not even a traditional civil servant. In no time, Greenham turned up at the Churchill to have private talks with Sir James in his room. Greenham said that he had been very proactive in discussions which led to the independence of Mauritius and Zambia. He said that integration or closer links with Seychelles was a non-starter as far as the British government were concerned. He said that although the British government was appreciative of the Democratic Party's pro-British stand, closer links were never going to happen. On his return to Seychelles, Sir James assembled his close collaborators to report on his talks in London. The general feeling of the group was utter disappointment with the attitude of the British government. Yes, I think uh, running Seychelles was quite a, a heavy financial burden for the British government and it, it suited them to, uh, to advise Mr. Mancam as uh, leader of the Democratic Party to opt for independence. He sent a cable to Seychelles to say that he had uh, a cable and a phone. I don't know if it was a phone or a cable, but it landed in Chamish Chetty's office. And where he said, guys, independence is, is inevitable. Either we take it or SP SPUP will take it. And I think we should take it. We should opt for it. And there was such a, you know, Shamri Shetty was going mad. He didn't know, now Jimmy wants independence and this and that. And, and then he rang Robert Frischo, he rang the others, and then they all came up. And then he says, what's going on? He's going mad or something like that. And then eventually, um, they said, right, but he's coming. So Jimmy said, listen, no move. You wait for me to come, I'll explain everything to you. And I was there with him. I says, okay, we say nothing. We embargo, we wait for Jimmy. They were all against it. When Jimmy came, he sat down. I happened to be there at that time. He sat down, and in a matter of a uh, few minutes, everybody was, was convinced that that was the way out. We need to go for independence too. And that shows also how the man knew his crowd, knew his people around him, the reality was that a lot of socialist nations and movements were ready to fund the SPUP because of its demand for independence, whereas there was going to be no funding for the DP so long as it stood for closer links. It was generally felt that Sir James should address the people of the Seychelles on the radio to explain as to why the DP had no option but to also go for a policy of independence. How many times, Sir James asked, can a man ask a woman to marry him? After so many negative responses, he has to face the reality with honour and dignity. Not all the supporters were happy with this turn of events. But when the next general elections came and both parties stood on a platform of independence, the Seychelles voted for Sir James. It was clear that if the Seychelles was going to be forced into independence, then Sir James was the best man to lead them. Now, development towards prime ministership, uh, it was important because in fact it meant that we were really and truly on the road to independence. So in those days we worked very close to the governor, although a lot of the country's residual power in terms of day-to-day -day affairs resided with the prime minister. Nonetheless, the governor still presided over the cabinet those days the cabinet was known as the Executive Council. It's only after we became independent that we really started to call the executive body a cabinet. So, becoming the first prime minister was uh, historic, a moment of good occasion, and uh, of course also made me realize the responsibilities which I had taken as the first, if you want, and foremost political leader in my country. It had been agreed that following the election, the British government would host a conference in London to determine the constitution for an independent Seychelles. Strangely, when the representatives of the two contending parties got to London, the feeling at the Foreign Office was that the two parties should attempt to work together in the Seychelles national interest instead of a few people who were politically sophisticated, 
utilizing their position to fight and neutralize each other, the national interest indicated that they should combine their efforts to work for the nation under the umbrella of a coalition government. Finally, Mr. President, it is my pleasant duty to hand over to you the constitutional instruments whereby Seychelles achieves its independence. I became president of Seychelles after we had introduced one year of coalition government in Seychelles. Under the independent constitution, I was to be the first president of the Republic of Seychelles, and my position should have endured until the time for the next election, which was due about three years hence. We did a constitution. Mr. Franz Albert Rede was made prime minister. The coalition year was the best year in the life of the Seychelles because we were putting behind us all the feuds, animosities, and hostilities which had existed throughout the period of bipartisan politics. Sir James had proved to be an ace PR man whose first mission was to put the Seychelles on the map. With his flamboyant and debonair style, he had done just that. He had soon become well known himself and was a favorite in the European gossip columns. One author wrote that Sir James had appeared for his interview with him in bare feet and had recited poetry throughout. So James was working hard and playing hard, and the Seychelles were rapidly becoming a number one destination. We would turn our radio on in the morning, and here is Jimmy, who has just come, woke up from State House at six o'clock in the morning, gone to the station, and was playing all those uh, Western country and Western music, all those melodies, all those love songs, you know. And everybody was like rejoicing, you know? And we know when he is not there because the music is not the same. And everybody, all the Seychelles Loire was so happy to be, uh, to be free. So we thought we were going to be free. And uh, Jim was really was uh, looked upon as our leader, savior, if you like to call it. And, um, Everybody looks forward to that new life. His enthusiasm, they say enthusiasm sells. Well, it certainly sold as far as Seychelles was concerned. Wherever Jimmy was, there was a party. Next thing you hear that you have a phone call, you know, oh, President Moncom is riding a bike in the middle of town, a bicycle. Yes, he did that as well. By creating a coalition, we brought about peaceful coexistence between the parties where family had been divided, one supporting red, one supporting blue. Everybody now was coming back to normal. Everybody was starting to understand that one may have different ideas in terms of political ideology. This didn't mean that we had to be enemies. When all these were manifesting themselves and producing fantastic conditions for the progress and stability of our small nation, we had the coup d'etat. This was not because the coalition was bad. It was because my prime minister, Mr. Franz Albert René, had made up his mind, had his own ambition. 
he wanted to acquire power at all costs. And maybe perhaps for me, after analyzing Rene's determination, since against his actions, there was acquisition of power, I realized that perhaps it was a good thing that I went to the Commodore conference because otherwise I could have been shot right there on the spot. The Seychelles had no army to defend themselves against the coup d'etat. Defenseless people were killed as imported Tanzanian soldiers helped René's followers to overpower the local police. René declared himself president and the years of darkness had begun. A fifth of the population of Seychelles fled into exile. North Korean soldiers arrived to train a new army loyal to René. The Seychelles were to enter a new era, an era where any notion of their past history was never to be mentioned. Anyone turning against René or speaking openly about the regime would be met with an iron fist. I really felt that a way of life for this country has come to its end. So it was like day and night. But it was like real, real darkness to lightness. I felt a bit like you feel when you, when there is a death in the family. We've never seen guns in our lives. And the day after the coup d'etat, you could see guns all over the islands. Uh, soldiers, militia, you can even go on the beach in the evening because there will be militia and you're likely to get uh, uh, stopped, arrested, or even beaten up. We became a society where, you know, all the joie de vivre and everything that we used to have pre-coup just disappeared. It was a great shock to realize that there was I who had given about five years as chief minister and uh, about the same time as prime minister and then become under law through the constitution. The first elected president of the Republic of Seychelles found myself, if you want, uh, isolated in London, deprived of my executive position and left alone to live a life in exile. I felt that Jimmy has been through a lot of pain. Um, president of Seychelles, and which didn't last very long, and then, you know, suddenly find yourself far away from home uh, in exile. And um, I mean, that itself is a traumatic experience. Having been a school friend with him and knowing the family, his parents, his mother, she was very fond of uh, my wife Susie and um, our twin daughters and then the brothers. It was painful for them too. I don't want to linger on this, but it's something I've always felt I w wanted to express because Far away from Seychelles, um, Jimmy's loved ones passed away. His brothers, his dear mom. As a priest, as a bishop, I've taken so many funerals. And uh, at funerals, we've always been able to welcome back loved ones from different parts of the world who always felt and this is um, natural, needed to be back for a loved one's funeral, parents, siblings. But what struck me was that Jimmy could never come back. And I always thought of him far away, although we didn't uh, correspond, I, I prayed for him. So then I started to say to myself, well, perhaps Rain has taken the Seychelles, Jim, but he has given you the world which in fact he did. So I saw a new world opening in front of me. Instead of the world of a limited Seychelles with all many problems, I saw a world open up which had unique opportunities.
I knew how much I had contributed through my hard work and dedication to the development of Seychelles. And I knew that I could utilize these qualities in order, if you want, to get for myself a comfortable life and to remain happy outside the islands. So, having espoused this philosophy of Rene, you've taken the Seychelles that you've given Jimmy the world. I then started to look for opportunities and to promote joint venture, transfer of technology, to go on lecturing course, and really to make sure that my life was a full one, full of activities, make new friends, whilst not forgetting the old ones. I first met Jimmy in 1977. It was just after the coup d'etat in Seychelles. I had my own uh, interview page on the evening news at the time, and uh, he was in the news in London, and I was asked to go and speak to him. It was uh, actually my day off, and um, I had planned to go riding in Hyde Park. But a friend of mine said, oh, you've got to go and speak to him. Uh, he lost everything. It's going to be a great story. And so I went. And uh, I remember the first time I saw him, he was sitting waiting for me in a hotel in Mayfair. And he had this huge air of heaviness about him. But he soon lost it. He took me to Wedgie's for lunch and he sang songs. He had this wonderful singing philosophy that there was a song in life for every situation. And... Um, he recited poetry and he held my hand and he drove me back uh, in his chauffeur driven car and I went in and um, everybody wanted to know what he was like and uh, I said that he'd held my hand and it was quite fun. I sat down and wrote the article uh, on the way out the editor said to me hey he said come back you didn't say anything about him holding your hand so I uh, borrowed a pen and just bent down and wrote on the end of the article he called for the bill and released my hand. Well, Jimmy thought that as I told all of the readers of the evening news that he'd been allowed to hold my hand, that he could ask me out. And he did. And eventually I went and we fell in love. So we moved into a little flat in Buckingham Gate. It was just around the corner from the palace. And Jimmy loved that because he's always been a great monarchist and he could look out of the window and see if the flag was up or the flag was down or the queen was in or the queen was out. And um, that, was, that was very interesting for him. It was very close to the evening news too for me and I go off to work in the morning and leave him there. And he had a whole new life to begin. I mean, uh, he'd been chief minister of his country, prime minister, first and founding president and not had a minute in the day. And now he had to really start all over again but it didn't take him long to get out his contact book. I was on one of the islands. I think it was St. Vincent Island. And I was uh, having a beer on a beach. And suddenly I started to count the different amount of beers available in that bar. There were beer from everywhere. It therefore dawned on me that this island did not have a brewery. Because normally, when an island has a brewery, this is against exorbitant import license for imported beers. So if this island did had all these beers, it was because there was no local beer to compete, no, no, no local brand to protect. So I went to see the government there and told them that I had my association in Germany who could be interested in building a brewery, if I could get from them a letter of intent. So it started that I went to see the minister. They had heard about my name because they were also members of Commonwealth. They were happy to give me a letter of intent. I took the letter of intent to Germany. Well, after <coughs> a year or two, we had got St. Vincent a brewery. After the deal was made between the government of St. Vincent and the German brewery Hasse Brewerei, Sir James became an international trade consultant, joint venture specialist and entrepreneur, quickly forging business relations with many companies. He was soon to become the president of Berlin European Airways, which would allow his German friends to fly within the Berlin Corridor prior to German reunification. 
He also had successful business relationships with many UK companies, one notably being Midland and Scottish Resources, an oil company run by a gentleman called Martin Dina. The 1980s were to provide Sir James with a totally different way of life to the one he had been used to. He and Australian journalist and author Catherine Olson were married in London and lived with their two children, Richard from Sir James's first marriage and Ben from Catherine's first marriage, with a yearly visit from his daughter Carolyn, who was based in Florida with her mother. And then they had a child of their own, Alexander. The following years were spent making new business associates and in doing so travelling the world and spending valuable time where possible with his family. It was a good life, a good stable life, and we were happy. One day I came to Putney, and then he told me, he said, go down and see the, the letters. I came up with four, and he told me, you see? And I told him, as you remember, when you used to go to the post office, it used to be loads of letters. He said, well, that, yeah. now there's only four. And uh, he told me, you see, I think he said that in his book also, that uh, many of his friends he thought were his friends, but they were the friends of the president. That speaks for itself. Thousand miles from anywhere in the middle of an ocean. Well, I got together with Jimmy in 89 to do business. But then, of course, the, the world changed and we realized there was also a political responsibility. And Jimmy said, we will need to start a movement called Crusade for Democracy in Seychelles and, 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 and get the world's attention on what is going on in Seychelles now, that the rest of the world has, communism has, has disappeared. So, uh, so that's how the whole thing started. And um, I was there, sitting in the office, on the other side of the desk, <laughs> that was my office, and, uh, but getting things done. So James and Paul Chow started the Crusade for Democracy in the Seychelles. They lobbied Western governments to stop giving aid to the dictatorship, even though a fellow dissident, Gerald Waro, had been shot and killed in the streets of London. I'm going back to the... After the Cold War had ended, René had lost his backing from the communist bloc and a move towards multi-party democracy was back on the cards. The collapse of communism was a very important factor in determining Mr. Inez, if you want, uh, uh, coerced decision to go for multi-party democracy. But uh, inside the islands was also obvious that all the socialist endeavors of Mr. Rene had proved failures. Mr. Rene had created National Youth Service, which was a failure. Social Marketing Board, which was a failure. Everyone of these uh, broadly projected socialist projects had backfired. It was a cold winter's day in late 1991 when an extremely surprising fax came through to the office in the Mansions house in Putney. Then one day I was walking past the office in our house in London and a fax was pushing its way out of the machine. So I waited for it and read it. And truly, I couldn't believe who it had come from. This was a copy of a letter from Mr. Rainey in Seychelles telling me that he had decided to return the country to multi-party democracy 
and that he thought that I should perhaps return to court with my share towards success of it. The big problem now, how do we go back to Seychelles? Jimmy Malcolm cannot just simply take a plane to go back to Seychelles. It's got to be a, a, a dramatic um, entry. Paul Chow went to Seychelles, discussed the matter, and immediately thereafter, Rene started to offer to each group which would constitute itself as a political faction a very big money subsidy on the part of the government. So obviously I could see that Rene was mindful of dividing the opposition. I told Paul Chow to tell to all opposition leaders not to fall victim to Rene's scheme and not to register. Unfortunately, the lieu of money was such that they took the money and overnight there was registered nine different political parties in opposition. There was always a question mark over this becoming a success. Fifteen years had passed and to many, James Manchin was just a name. The house he had on the northeastern side of Mahe and Glassie had been nationalised and left in ruins. We managed to raise this seed money, together with some commercial help, to bring, I think, 20 people together with Jimmy. And we had this big arrival in Seychelles. Having been outlawed for 15 years, Sir James's Democratic Party reformed and invited supporters to meet him at the airport for his eagerly anticipated return. On the 12th of April, a huge crowd began to gather early. They wore blue, the Democrats' traditional colour, and sang La Paloma Blanca, Sir James's favourite song, a song that had been banned by René. By the time Sir James's aeroplane hit the tarmac, it was clear that he was going to receive a hero's welcome. 10,000 people were at the airport to meet him. They welcomed him with a display of uninhibited joy, calling him the father of the nation. Later that day, the Seychelles held the biggest rally it had ever seen, with just under a third of the island's population attending. I was uh, happy to see the spontaneous reaction of the crowd. This was not a rented crowd situation. It was a crowd who came spontaneously, and it was there for all of you to see. Some journalists I met this morning who's been filming and said, look, I've done 25 years of television photographing around the world. He said, I never saw such enthusiasm. So I'm very happy, very touched, and somewhat also very aware of the responsibility which I have got to assume in the interest of my people. For me, the, the uh, reception that Jimmy got was not entirely a surprise. I always knew he would get that kind of reception. The surprise was that, um, you know, it's, it, um, the enthusiasm that came out was much more than I expected. Secondly, in my, but my position was a bit more, a bit difficult compared to those because I was inside looking out kind of thing and I had, we had arranged certain things and we didn't, we had no idea how it was, it was going to turn out. For example, getting him out of the airport was something that we never anticipated was going to be a problem. And it was almost impossible to get him from that bit where when he came out of the official side of the airport, try to get on the main road. It was. If you if you see the video, it, it it was like, you know, a film star kind of thing. You know, those those occasions where everybody was scrambling to, to touch him, and uh, 
And the big rally we had in the afternoon in downtown Victoria, in the, and, um, and, and it, was, it was amazing. It was an occasion that nobody would have missed that day, and I was happy to, to be part of it. And in a sense, to make history, because uh, we haven't seen that before in Seychelles. I think if, if Jimmy had really come out guns blazing, a lot of us would not be here today. You know, during the election night, we were all so afraid that I had to find somewhere a secret place to sleep, and I ended up Vista Doma with a room booked under somebody else's name. Once we uh, came and looked at the security situation, us being in the trade which we are, it didn't take us long to notice there was another security team of foreigners who were really interested in what we were doing and doing a little bit of uh, intelligence work, checking about their movements, where they came from. They were foreigners. I don't want to mention their nationality on this film, but it was obvious that they were there to try and disrupt or kill uh, Sir James Mancombe if uh, he had won. When it was time to return to Seychelles, I had to face certain realities against the background of my uh, commitment to see peaceful changes taking place in the country. I had to take into account the fact that about 20,000 Sechua people had left the Seychelles and they were mostly my supporters. I had to take account of the fact of the fact of polarization. I had also to take into account the fact that Rene had an army and that I had returned to play on a field demarcated by him with referees and linesmen appointed by him and regulation made by him. Therefore, it was important for me to behave as I did like a statesman. And I therefore said that I had returned within the spirit of an apostle of national reconciliation. This somewhat made him feel rather comfortable in terms of trying to bring about much needed changes in the nation. It is a policy of national reconciliation which in fact brought about that semblance of stability and political, if you want, uh, uh, quality which enable us to go into the process of a constitutional conference to determine the elements for the constitution of the Third Republic. When he f first came back from exile and had just landed at the airport, straight into a mass rally, and the first words he uttered was one of a call for national reconciliation. Why was that pertinent? Because he could have taken the road of revenge, of confrontation, of retribution, of being a populist or a demagogue. And uh, it reminds me of people like Mandela and Kenyatta when they had served long exiles, but in prison, when they came out, they could have taken the other road. They did not. And this is why I said in my article and to Mr. Mankam, history one day will judge or recognize you for the value of that proposal, of which many, I still believe, do not fully appreciate. Today, Seychelles, I believe, has relatively more harmony and stability were it not for the approach, the contribution of what I believe national reconciliation was all about. One of the things I would say about him is that in spite of all the advice that we bring up and things that we think he ought to do, ultimately what he decides, whether we are, sometimes we disagree, we think this is not the way to do things but ultimately it comes out to be the right choice. You know, this, this is Jimmy, this is what I found about the man. 
that um, it ends up in the end being the right thing that could have been done. And uh, because if, if he had done it the way we would have liked, the consequences would have been different. For example, the issue of reconciliation. He had no choice. If he, was, if he had adopted what most people, or were not, or at least the opposition people said, should have stood up and said, now is the moment to go. He, first of all, he would not have been able to return to Seychelles again. So he would have been ineffective. It would have destroyed the, any prospect of a transition. In spite of what we say, his, his decision to, to uh, promote reconciliation. And, and that, of course, took René by surprise. It took René between 93, when we had the first election, and 95, two years, to recover from that. Because I can assure you, you know, in those three, first three years, René was a lamb. He couldn't, whatever Jimmy said, Jimmy, René would agree. But Jimmy being Jimmy was never an outrageous guy that would say outrageous things or request outrageous things. So, so he, he, I think he is creating those th three years created the main stability of the Seychelles that we are enjoying today. April 1992 soon turned into July 1993, and the first presidential election since the new constitution was voted in came to pass. It was no surprise that Albert René's SPPF won. The Democratic Party had been in the Seychelles for over a year by that stage and were under financial pressure, whilst the SPPF seemed to have a bottomless pit of money. Albert René's party were also blessed with having a proactive mouthpiece as far as all television and radio were concerned. But the strongest reason why the Democrats lost was that since the coup, some 20,000 supporters had fled the country and weren't allowed to vote. Although we did not win the election, we had in fact won the war. The war of dismantling what René stood for during the time of his one-party state dictatorship. For the next five years, Sir James sat as leader of the opposition on the National Assembly. His house and lands, all of which had been confiscated, were eventually returned to him, and the country, for the first time in a long time, was deemed to be free. Around 1998, when Sir James decided to launch the movement for national reconciliation between nations and within nations. Before long, he was attending peace-orientated lectures all around the world. Sir James started thinking that maybe the position he was gaining as a national statesman was not entirely compatible with his position as a party leader. Good morning. <laughs> I really, really enjoy it. City World is Cardinals. He was making a difference, but felt that the preoccupation of the politician was the next election, whilst the preoccupation of the statesman was the next generation. I felt that perhaps it was in the better interest of Seychelles for me to play the role of statesman. After all, I know what power is all about, and I know too that considering the fact that we had been under one party rule for more than 15 years, there were some very fundamental changes which we had to bring about, and that it was easier to do so from an overview standpoint rather than from a confrontational standpoint. In other words, from a statement position rather than that of a party leader. His new career as an ambassador for peace stems from the fact that in his books he has written a lot. He had always spoken about the need for national reconciliation, dialogue among nations, among people. And other former world leaders who were also members of the same peace foundation, they had a checkered history of infighting, of civil war, of uh, disagreements, and none of them had ever come forward to say now it's the time to heal, to reconcile. Jimmy was singled out by Reverend Moon 
as the one who preached real, genuine peace. The peace from the heart, not just a peace on paper that would be torn the next day. And for that, he was singled out as the person, as a statesman, to bring this foundation forward, to uh, come to the open, to speak it out. And uh, unsurprisingly, he was always asked to attend and to address as a keynote speaker in those conferences. It is the great Mahatma Gandhi who said that there is enough in this world for everybody's need, but not enough for anybody's greed. And speaking to us, he revealed one fact, that the total defense budget of the world is about 40 times more than what the world is spending on human resources development. He always reports on, on what uh, went on during his tour overseas. And uh, if you've followed his, his, uh, his reports, or what I call those reports, although they came in the form of articles in, in the Seychelles Review, I mean, you would you would see immediately that uh, promoting Seychelles overseas and uh, promoting world peace is, are the two things which, are, which he is busy, always busy at. I met Sir James Mancham in June of 2005 at the Universal Peace Federation Conference for World Leaders. And I was attending that conference with my uh, late husband, Sir Tom Davis, the former Prime Minister of the Cook Islands. And when Sir James got up to speak, I was enormously impressed with what he had to say, his ideology and his passion for world peace. And I believe that uh, everybody else was very impressed with him at that time, too. So um, he was uh, asked to become the president of the Universal Peace Federation. And I believe that took him on quite an extensive journey, traveling all around the world, promoting world peace. For today, when we speak about war, we must not forget the potential of total destruction. And I do believe, too, that we must start to bring the message of peace right from the beginning with our children. He grasps uh the issues and is able to put them in such a way that people really uh, love to hear what he has to say and they listen to him when he talks. Um, he's really quite skilled in his ability to uh, connect with people and uh, I think also promote world peace on many very tense issues. This is the third time that I've responded positively to the invitation of Dr. Jagdish Gandhi to attend a Chief Justice's conference focused above all to change the world to a better world and take into account as a matter of priority the welfare of children. There is no such other initiative which has been taken globally. For this one must pay tribute to Dr. Gandhi and of course to the city of Lucknow was always afforded us a very warm, warm welcome and will certainly go down in this show of the world as a city which takes care of the children in the pursuit of a better world order. When he recently received the International Jurist Award, Award for 2011, on my con congratulating him, certain thoughts came to my mind. And one of them, the first one was, many do not know or are ignorant or forget that Mr. Mankam is also a jurist by his former past occupation. And I believe those skills recently, two illustrations. One was his remarks in Nairobi when he was last there. And he was directing himself to two leaders of the country in Kenya, who are in the midst of a very torn apart society. 
and are struggling to try and bring back some sanity, some cohesion, uh, some, if you like, late attempts to finally build the nation, which cannot be built on hatred and division. Never. That skid was also shown at home recently in his uh, remarks and support for the anti-piracy crusade when he particularly called for all party support. So I added this in my congr congratulations to him because I thought it, it, it fitted in. From 1998 to the present day, Sir James has dedicated his time to many endeavors. On the home front, he's still very much a part of local politics. He has a philosophy that the Seychelles have to think of their future and not their past. Can you give us some examples of the use of soft power in your country, the uh, Seychelles? Well, I've tried to bring about soft power by bringing about uh, national reconciliation. I've taken an overview. It requires you to take an overview, trying to see both sides of the story, and then to realize that you are committed by geography or history to stay together under the same roof. So you are an alternative but to start dialoguing. And if you are dialoguing, you must be prepared for compromise. Many years have passed since his return and a new generation is coming to the fore. Sir James would like nothing more than to see peace within the islands, clearly remembering that the best year for the archipelago was a pre-coup year when the coalition was working so well. On the international front, he spends most of the year traveling the planet lecturing tirelessly on the geopolitics of the Indian Ocean and world peace, two subjects he is an expert on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Master of Ceremony, for all these beautiful words you said about me. There's only one point I'd like to take issue with you when you said that I come from a small country in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Because I've always taken the view myself that no country is small if it is surrounded by the sea. Always a great raconteur, he has written over eight books and made a DVD with over 35 poems against the backdrop of his home islands. There is no doubt that the aptly dubbed Hurricane Jimmy will be making an impact on all that he touches for years to come. Would not keep any grudge against anyone, regardless who you are. In a way, what I would summarize about Jimmy Mankam, of all the politicians in our country, he is the only one who sacrificed his ambition for the sake of the country. I don't think anybody else has done that. If we were to make an inventory of all the ideas that had been brought by Jimmy Mankam and his team, and then he would say, where do you see it in the cells of today? You would see it on the shelves of the government. It's there. They use it, which is a good thing, which means that uh, there may not be political uh, conflict, but there is certain political ideas that's going through. That's being adhered to. We need to say thank you, Twin, for still preaching reconciliation. It's a seed which takes time to germinate, takes time to grow. But then I think suddenly, finally, history was going to prove what he's done. It's a great privilege to say that you know Jim Mangam and that you are a friend of Jim Mangam. I think the world has never been in a more messy situation. In the greater picture, one cannot be blind to the fact that today nations have built up nuclear capacity, which could, in effect, bring about the end of the world and a lot of catastrophe. So there is, therefore, no win in uh, hard power. There is no victor in terms of war. Over the years, I've become more and more convinced that the only way towards peace is through the concept of soft power and cultural diplomacy. Nations must learn to carry on, to dialogue, 
Even during the Second World War, Winston Churchill stated that talk talk is better than war war. There is no room in today's world to call the nation rogue states. Because once you've called a state a rogue state, then you're really saying we cannot sit on the same table, we cannot talk, we cannot discuss. So it's important to be realistic and to be enlightened because today, sadly enough, we have allowed nation to build up nuclear capacity to an extent that uh, the world is potentially in a very dangerous situation. Sadly, too, we have moved away from uh, the idols which, uh, if you want, give uh, a shining image to democratic government. We have seen a situation where we have moved away from the philosophy of right is might to a philosophy of might is right. This doesn't occur very well for the future well-being of our planet and of the people of this world. Smell the newborn hay. I can hear God's voices calling from my golden skylight way. Una paloma blanca. I'm just a bird in the sky. Una paloma blanca. Over the mountains of fly. I had my share of losing Once they locked me on a chain Yes, they tried to break my power Oh, I still can feel 